The following is a recording of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, visit gpts.edu. All right. Um, It's... It is 15 after. Uh, Any announcements? Oh, I've got some. Uh, We have a first-year rep. Um, Alex Mager. So um, he was elected unanimously. (laughs) We won't go into the details on that one. Um, Don't forget about the picnic this Saturday. Yes, Mr. Uh, Ellis. That's a reminder to silence our phones, myself included. Okay, other announcements? All right, um, prayer requests. I do plan to pray for the uh, Supreme Court nomination and the aftermath of that. Um, I don't know if you know this, but several of the justices actually were nominated and then confirmed in, in the, on the same day. So it doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out process. Anything else? Yes? More, more of a phrase, but um, some of you may see on Facebook, I posted a picture of a huge tree near our house fell and hit the power lines, and uh, it just fell away from the house. Uh, the rest of the girls were actually walking around that tree like Indeed. We pray for the Shelton. Uh, Morgan said he and Manny are down in Charleston for a procedure for Eli. They'll be back this afternoon. So <coughs> pray for them. Yes. And you did say it was her grandfather? Yeah, her grandfather. Okay. Okay. Other prayer requests? Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, Before we rise to sing hymn hymn number 705, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, Our speaker is Pastor Paul Sanders. He is the senior pastor. Is Is that your title? Senior pastor of Christ Community Church. That's a PCA congregation in Simpsonville. So we're very glad to have him come today and minister to us from God's word. Let's stand now and sing hymn number 705. Redeem me 
for his own. But I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that within my heart but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day I know not how the spirit moves Convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through His work, creating faith in Him. But I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me, of weary ways or golden days before his face I see, but I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him for me, him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful that, yes, indeed, we know whom we have believed, and we are also very thankful that we know he knows us extremely well. We ask, Father, that we would always be mindful of all that you have given to us, all that you have blessed us with through your Son, through his atoning blood, even through his exaltation to your right hand where he intercedes for us. And Father, we give you thanks for the ministry of the Holy Spirit as well. We ask, Lord, that we would always be looking to you for all that we need. And, Father, we do want to give you praise for how this tree that fell and none of Ben's family were injured. There was no injury to the house. And, Lord, it is obvious that tree needed to come down. And we're thankful that there was no injury. We do want to pray for little Levi as he's going to be going through a procedure, and we're thankful for how you have sustained him, how you have blessed his growth, and we trust, Lord, that you will continue to do that. Pray that that procedure would go extremely well. And, Lord, we pray for Jay, Caleb's wife's grandfather. And, Father, we are thankful that he knows you, and we do know that you tell us in your word that you do 
rejoice in the death of your saints. But Father, we pray that you would comfort him and his wife and all of his loved ones. And we ask, Lord, that when he passes, it will be sweet when he passes into your glory. Also, Father, we want to pray for Francis. We're thankful that things look good for him and trust that you will continue to bless him. We also want to pray for the wife, for David's wife, that you would, I mean, Mark's wife, that you would minister to her physical needs. Lord, we would ask that you would grant wisdom as to whether or not she needs to go to a specialist. And if she does, Lord, then we pray that that specialist will determine what's the best course of action for her condition. And Father, we do so thank you for these chapel times. And we would ask humbly that you would bless this time with your presence and with your power as a means of glorifying yourself, but also as a means of blessing us, your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of the scriptures. Man, our scripture this morning is from Romans chapter 6, verses 8 through 14. And as we read the scripture, remember, we're convinced it is the inspired and the infallible, the inerrant word of God. It's, it's true in all that it claims. You can trust it with all your heart. It will not let you down. Romans 6, 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider, consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do that work that you so love to do in the life of your people, that you would teach us, that you would instruct and correct us, that you would rebuke us, that you would train us in all righteousness for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it's so good to be with you. Um, as I preach this morning, just so you know, a little personal backdrop, I'm a I'm a longtime son of the PCA. My father entered into the PCA when I was one. Uh, he would pastor uh, all of, uh, of my young life growing up. He would be the first program coordinator at Ridge Haven Conference Center. That would get us to Rivard, where he would um, pastor some more in that area as well. Uh, and then from, from there, pretty soon, I found myself under Dr. Gordon Reed. Some of you know Gordon Reed. He has an um, instrumental uh, piece of Second Pres Greenville remaining uh, true to the scriptures and to the Reformed faith and, and on that biblically orthodox and Reformed trajectory that they still thankfully are on today. And under Gordon Reed, I'd serve uh, these small churches out in Clarendon County uh, for uh, around 10 years, and, and they really were the ones that set me on the path to seminary. My seminary story was, was a 10-year track while serving in, on the ministry staff with Dr. Gordon Reed. And, um, and certainly I treasure those times. I would be then in Spartanburg and in the Roebuck area with Richard Thomas at Mount Calvary Press for six years before finding myself in 2011 uh, at Christ Community Church and, and a congregation and a, and a people that have been such a joy and a blessing to know and to grow with. And so um, 
all of that backdrop and that faithfulness that God's been to me, I still stand before you as a man that just struggles in faith and in life. Uh, boy, I can't imagine not having some of the, the kindness of the Lord in my upbringing that He gave me. Where would I be? Um, my goodness. But um, thanks be to God uh, for His grace, and thanks be to God for His perseverance and His long enduring with His people. Uh, you know, there's not really a I, I'm one of those that you would pray for your own children. Lord, may there not be a time that they didn't know Jesus and love Jesus and, and Christ converted me at a very young age. And I'm, I'm confident of that. I'm sure of that. And, and yet I look at the very the majority of my life that you would say has been in Christ and I say, boy, what a struggle, what a battle, what a fight um, to live unto my God and to present myself unto Him. Uh, and... I want us to think about that as we consider the text that we just read. You know, what, what is it um, that you present yourself to each day, your minds to each day? What do you present your hands and your legs and your feet to each day? Uh, what are we presenting our, our, our body members uh, to each day? We're, we're presenting ourselves, all of ourselves, all of our bodies, all of our minds, all of our heart. We're, we're presenting those things to someone or something every single day. And in doing so, our bodies are instruments for either sin to unrighteousness or to God for righteousness. And what does knowing the truths that we considered in Romans 6 have to do with that daily presentation? You know, when uh, you guys are smarter than me, so you can probably think of, of some tools that could be used neutrally or, this, or, or neutral in how they can be used. And every tool I can think of can be used personally. Every tool I think of can be used for evil or for good. You know, you can use a knife to save someone's life in surgery, and you can use a knife to take someone's life. You can use a, a gun to protect, or you could use a gun to take the life of someone. Yeah, I go down the list of every tool I can think of, some of the most incredible uh, creations of, 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 of the human mind, and then, you know, that's another tool that can be used for a lot of good stuff or a lot of bad stuff. And so there's really not a neutrality to most every tool. And it's the same way with us, isn't it? It's the same way with our persons. It's the same way with our bodies. It's the same way with our minds. Instruments for either righteousness or evil. None of, of what makes us up is neutral. We are, our persons are either instruments for unrighteousness or righteousness. And our use has everything to do with who we're presenting ourselves to each day. You know, perhaps your experience is like mine. You, you realize that you've sinned in thought or word or deed, and you tell yourself, well I'll, well, I'll do better. I'll try harder. But another day and another defeat, a lack of self-control in mind or word or mouth or body. And, and, you know, in another letter, Paul tells us that there's two kinds of people in this world. There's the natural man and the spiritual man. And the natural man's lost in his sin. While the spiritual man saved by Christ and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, and we understand that the spiritual man can have any less or any more of the Holy Spirit than he has, but he sure can have less or more empowering by the Spirit day to day. And I don't know that I've always understood, how do I access that, the power of God's Spirit who lives in me? day to day. It's, it's like we can be on this hill of temptation thinking if we just try harder or do better, we'll get over the hill and we exhaust ourselves and maybe we find ourselves conceding, I just can't do it. I don't know. Is this just who I am? You know, and if I asked you, have you ever, have you ever appropriated the filling and power of God's Spirit? Would, would you understand what I'm asking? It's an important part of living life. It's an important part of making it through seminary and serving in ministry. And in chapter 8, in the text we just read, Paul speaks more specifically um, to, it, later on in chapter 8, he speaks more specifically to the Holy Spirit, but I believe the first few steps on the pathway that is abiding in the power of God's Spirit are in the text that we just read. And, and they're captured by the words, know, consider, and present. And you'll see that in Paul on several occasions. Know, consider, present. The first thing you see there in verse 8 to 10 is and if we're going to begin to appropriate the power of the Spirit of God who lives within us and everyone who knows Christ has the Spirit, the first step is knowing what is true. Uh, you guys in seminary, you're learning a lot about what's, what's true. 
And, and that's the first thing, isn't it? Early, earlier in chapter 6, in verse 3 and 6, we see that a Christian is a person who's died to sin. You see that in chapter 6, 3 and 6. If we're united to Christ through faith, we see that we're no longer under the reign and the ruling power of sin. That, that old self that did not know Jesus is dead. The you without Jesus is no more. There's a new man. That means we no longer ha have to be slaves to sin. And so we must know these realities. We must know that we're free from sin. We must know, though we're not rid of the attacks, though we're not rid of the temptations, that though the sin nature is still waging war, the remnants that are left are still waging war, but it no longer rules. This is important to know. Paul says, know this. Know these things about you. Know these things that are true about Christ and that because of what Christ has done are true about you. And he continues in 8 and 9 saying, we must know that because we're united to Jesus... Now we live with Him. We've been raised to a newness of life. As Christ died once, overcame death and sin, never to die again, so too will it be for us who are in Christ. Our new life's begun. It has begun now. Yeah, we, yeah it's, it's appointed once for every man to die and after that the judgment, right? But yet, the new life has begun. Your sin nature's been rendered powerless. It's still present. The remnants of it are there. It can still influence you, but it's no longer your master. And here Paul tells us that our resurrection in Christ, it begins at the new birth, not at the second coming. It's important to know this. When we're united to Jesus and we're raised again with Christ, that not only points to a day when we'll be raised again in our mortal bodies to reign eternally with Christ and the saints, but it also points to the new life that is now in which God is working His grace in us and out of us. And he's, he, he's not only imputed righteousness to us, he's, he's given us the grace to become more and more righteous. And so, when we trust in Jesus Christ, we, when we have faith in Him and we're united to Him, we're not, we're not only dead to sin, we're alive to Christ. And Paul wants us to know this. He says, know this. He wants us to know these things about ourselves. We're, we're dead to sin. We're now truly alive in Jesus. He, he's saying God's grace is a radically transforming power. He, he does not only forgive us from sin. When he saves us, he gives us new life now. Forgiveness and the new birth. They come, they come together. They're a package deal. Um, I think it was... Um, Goodness, I lose his name. Pastor from, from out of Atlanta. But he had used the illustration of, uh, uh, imagine a ship uh, run by this evil captain, e evil Captain Jones, think Pirate of the Caribbean. And, and a Captain Smith comes aboard who's a good and righteous leader, and he raises up a coup. And, and, and the crew suggests that, that old Captain Jones walked the plank, but Smith says, look, I'm in charge now. He's no longer in charge. Uh, we stand against him. He's powerless. He has no influence here. And so, and so the old captain remains. He's no longer in charge. And one day old Captain Jones is, just gets up yelling orders again. The evil Captain Jones is just kept telling guys what to do, yelling at them, cussing them out. And, and, and some, just because of those old patterns, there they go, start obeying Captain Jones again, doing what he's saying, following his evil orders. And then Captain Smith says, what in the, what in the world are you doing? He's not in charge anymore. I'm in charge. You don't have to listen to him. He's powerless to lead you and to control you. Why are you listening? He's no longer over you. And, and, and that's like that old, the, the remnants of that sin nature in us, that it shouts out these orders. Oh, if you, if you don't lust, you won't be satisfied. That old sin nature shouts out those, those temptations. If you don't boast, no one else will respect you. If you don't gossip, no one else will listen to you. If you don't cheat, you will lose. And we start scrambling and succumbing. And Christ says, what are you doing? Why are you listening? Sin is no longer your master. It no longer has power over you. And so Paul, in writing, is saying, look, the first step in experiencing the power of God's Spirit that he's going to speak far more to in chapter 8 is to know what is true. Know who you are in Christ. Know what his death and resurrection means in the now. But then the next thing Paul says is that we must consider. If you look at verse 11, consider. See that word jump out at you. And all these truths that he's talking to, he calls us to consider these truths. Consider the implication of these truths. Consider the truth you know. That, that word means to, to take into account, to contemplate, to think about. 
Paul, Paul is telling us you need to pause daily and reflect on, on the truths that you're learning, on, on the truth that you know, on the reality of who you are, on the reality of who Christ is, on the reality of what he has done, to reflect upon what Christ has done for you regularly, to consider the reality that you are dead to sin. Don't just know it. Think about it. Think about how, what are the implications of this for me today? You know, I think some Christians believe that God saved us back then and he's going to save us in the future when he comes again. But in between, we're kind of on our own. I mean, I think there's Christians that live like that. And Paul's emphasizing that many of us never stop to think about how what he has done and what he has finished and what he has accomplished impacts us now in the present. We've been given such a glorious gift, but how often do we reflect upon it and consider it and live out of it. It's like, it's like a young man who's, who's been single for a long time. And he's married, a wonderful bride. But, but he's having a hard time remembering that he's not single anymore. He, he's doing things like just going to run errands without leaving a note. Uh, he's making, making major plans or purchases without having a conversation and talking about that with his bride. And, and an older godly man pulls him aside and says, Son, you, you need to consider... You're married now. When it comes to these things, you, you need to consider what that means. You're one now. You see, it's not that that guy has to, has to sit there and say, well, if I think hard enough, I'll be married. He, he's married. He just needs to consider it and live accordingly. It's like a, like a, a woman who's grown up in a setting where she hasn't been loved or, or cared for uh, with any kind of devoted, nurturing love, and suddenly she's in a relationship with a man who's her husband, and he loves her, and he cares for her, and he wants to nourish her. And she has a hard time embracing that and taking that in. It's hard for her to believe it because she didn't experience it for 20-some years in her life. And, and a wise, godly woman takes her aside and says, you know, you need to consider how crazy your husband is about you. You need to think about that and, and, and take it in and, and then consider the implications of that for your marriage and your life. See, when we consider we're dead to sin and, and alive to Jesus because we've been given this incredible legal right that, that unless we contemplate it regularly, we're going to live as if it's not ours to benefit from now. If we don't consider it daily, we might go out there today and live as if these things are not true for us. What Christ has done and what he's accomplished and what he's freed from, the chains that he's broken off of our, our, our arms and legs. So it's like if, you, if, if, a, if a trust fund is put in your name and you never draw from it, your, fin your financial situation hasn't changed. In practicality, on paper it's changed. The truth is it's changed. But in practical, everyday living, it hadn't changed. It, it, it could be the end of your financial troubles, but it's of no impact because you don't take the time to consider, wait a second, <laughs> this, this really is mine. I really can draw from that. And there's implications for my life because of that. So, so we're to know the truth, as Paul says, to know who we are, to know what Christ has accomplished, and then we're to consider the truth and how it impacts us today. And then... In 12 to 14, you see that other key word that, that I just wanted to frame our text with today, present. We're to present ourselves to God. We know, we know what is true, who Christ is, what he's done, what that means for us. We consider those things. We contemplate those things. We give time to thinking about the implication. And okay, there's a presentation now to be made by the Christian. Presenting ourselves to God for righteousness. You know, Paul said in verse 12, to not let sin reign. So, so when old Captain Jones comes back around like he owns a place, we remind him, no, you don't. When, when, when the, the flesh begins to, to call out orders, we say, mm -mm, you, you don't own me anymore. You don't, you don't, you're not the shot caller. You, you don't run the show. We remind sin that tempts us, that it, 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 it no longer has that authority. And one of the first ways that... that, that Really, we know God is doing a work of grace in our lives. One of those early ways is, is we begin to see that decreasing desire for, for the very things that our flesh is calling out for. We, we begin, begin to see some of those things losing their, uh, their call, their influence upon us, increasing in our desire to, to live unto Christ, to live a life of godliness. We, we begin to understand the psalmist when he says, Wow, Lord, I love your law. How I love your law. And Paul's saying that, hey, that's an evidence of sins. Uh, that's one of the evidences 
of sin's reign is when you're totally captive to sin. But when grace comes, you're freed up. You're liberated from that captivity. New life brings a decisive break with, with the desires of sin and an and, and advent of new desires for righteousness. doesn't mean there's still not tension and, con- and, and struggle within. Uh, but, but there's a battle, right? Because the Spirit is alive and well. We know we don't always follow those new di- desires consistently, but thank God we don't always follow those old desires consistently as we used to. And that's evidence of God's grace. The, the, the cravings of sin, as, as Paul's talking about, present yourselves, present your bodies to God for righteousness. The, the cravings of sin often utilize the body in order to meet their interest. It was, it was true in the first century. It's true today. Lust, greed, pride, untru- untruthfulness, strife, worldliness. Paul says don't let, it, don't, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. He's very aware that, that the flesh can itself become a conduit for unrighteousness, a tool, an instrument for unrighteousness. And so he says, no, present your bodies to God every day. Know what's true. Consider what's true. And then make a presentation daily. Lord, here I am. Here's my mind. Here's my hands. Here's my eyes. Here's my my feet. Because we know our eyes can be a portal for sin. Uh, We we know our eyes can be a portal for for lust, for, uh, for jealousy, for envy. For coveting, our mouths can be instruments of sin. For gossip or slander, our our minds, avenues for sin. Our hands, our feet, all of our body parts, instruments, potentially for unrighteousness. And God's saying through the Apostle Paul, Christian, look at how the body itself can be used by Satan as a portal for sin. And don't, you don't have to let that happen. Don't let that happen. Because you're not under the reign of Satan anymore. Present all of yourself unto God then for righteousness. You know, I think, again, in in our American Christianity, and I'm sure it's common across the borders, but many Christians want forgiveness, but they really don't want holiness. Maybe you've you've heard the saying, well, Lord, it's a sarcastic saying, Lord, sanctify me, but not yet. A child's prayer once read, Lord, make me a better boy. But if you can't make me a better boy, it's all right, because I really like the way I am. And sometimes that's our attitude. Well, we, we want the salvation. We want the promise of eternal life in heaven. But we really don't always want to be holy. And that's the feeling of, of many, many Christians. They're, they're perfectly happy being forgiven but not holy. They're, they're happy being accepted but not righteous, forgiven, justified, but not sanctified. And the Apostle Paul does not consider that posture towards sin to be an option, does he? He really doesn't give us that option if we're in Christ. Justification and sanctification, package deal. God's forgiveness and God's delivering us from the dominion of sin, package deal. God doesn't just save us so we can be forgiven and go on in our bondage uh, to a life of sin. He saves us to deliver us. From that bondage. Uh, and so he wrote, don't allow any part of yourself to be used as a tool for sin. Present all of yourself to God. You know, when I think about, boy, as I've wrestled with this own text in my life, what, what, would it, what difference would it make for me if daily I followed this paradigm that shows up in some of the Pauline writings? No, consider, present. That, that I get up in the morning remembering what I know. Hey, I'm I I really am bought with the blood of Jesus. I really am delivered out of the ownership of sin. Then considering those implications of the gospel for my life, what these truths mean for my day, that Christ saved me from my sin. He's the master. Sin's no longer the master. And then I'm presenting myself before I go about my ministry even. I'm presenting myself to God. Lord, here I am. Here's my mind. Here's my eyes. Here's my hands. Here's my feet. How's that going to impact my first words to my children in the morning? I'm I'm not a good morning guy. But what difference might this make? Presenting myself to God. Seeking the power of His Spirit to carry out. Lord, here's my eyes. They're yours. Here's my hands. Here's my feet. Here's my mouth. All of me. Empower me. I'm presenting myself to you. Empower me to be an instrument of righteousness. 
in, in, in how I converse in ministry and in, in how I converse with the waiter or waitress and how I talk with my staff. And here's the thing, as, as Paul, at the end of our text, was, was saying that, that sin will not have dominion over you. You're no longer under law, you're under grace. That, you know, we, we see that when we realize we can't, but that God can, and we realize when we present ourselves to him, we begin to unleash the, the power of the Spirit in us. Augustine said, Lord, command what you will, but give what you command. In other words, Lord, I know your, what your law commands me to do, but I don't know how to do it unless you give me the grace. And Paul says that's, grace leads the way for this. He mentioned in verse 14, we're no longer under law, we're under grace. Grace is the, it's the driver, it's the motivation. We're not motivated by earning uh, through the law the favor of God because we know we've blown it at every point. And I think otherwise we find ourselves in the self-righteous shoes of the Pharisees. But no, the law cannot save us. It cannot motivate us to be holy. It shows us we're not holy. And it drives us to the one who makes us holy. Romans, uh, later on, if you, if you look a few chapters later in Romans 8, 3 and 4, we read, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the law doesn't have the power to help us do what we're to do, yet we desire to be tools of righteousness, to abide by the law because of grace. Grace gives us the motivation and the power to do what the law tells us to do. And grace motivates us because we've been redeemed. We've been forgiven. We've been empowered. I mean, think of it, man. What, what, what will it mean if because of God's grace to you that, that daily you present yourself to God each day? You're, you're receiving so much good truth here in seminary. You know, I likened my seminary experience to a thirsty man ha having a, a fire hose unleashed upon his face. And that was spread out over 10 years. <laughs> and I know a lot of you guys are crunching it in in the three to the four year deal or, or maybe less if you're busting it. But, but I, in 10 years, guys, I just feel like I'm so thirsty for truth and then they're unloading a fire hose right in my face. I'm like, I can't even drink all that. But don't simply learn it and move on. Take time, take moments to consider it. You know a lot. Consider it. Consider the implications for the now in your marriage, for the now in your singleness, for the now in your fathering, for the now in, in, your, in your side job that you're looking to make money, and the now in your, in your ministry. Take time to consider it. Oh, you know a lot. Consider it. Consider the beauty of it. And then after considering those truths, it's, make it a daily rhythm. Present yourselves unto God. Take the truth you know and considered and, and say, Lord, here I am. This, I'm presenting myself to you for righteousness in the way that I interact with my family or with my wife or with my children. Uh, I'm, I'm presenting myself to you for righteousness in, in the way that I, I, I look at um, my social life or my friendships or my dating life. Lord, I'm presenting myself unto you for, for how I go about my studies, how I interact with my my classmates and my professors. I'm presenting my, my, my life to you even as I, as I go to this restaurant, how I interact with the people there. Present yourself to God in your, in, in your marriage, in your seminary, in your singleness, in your church ministry, with your neighbors, with your technology, with your entertainment. Present yourself to God. I love Colossians 3, 1, 1 through 4, that I... That, Captures in a bit, it's different words, but as I'm thinking through the, the no consider, present paradigm, it seems like I see it a little bit. I may be stretching. But in, in three, one through four, if 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 then you've been no if if then you've been raised with Christ, that's what we know. Been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above. I, as I think of seeking the things that are above, I, my mind goes to considering that there's a there's a lot of contemplation about God, the things of God, what he's done. 
and then set your minds on the things above. That could be a little bit of consider, couldn't it? But there's also a presentation there that, that I'm giving, I'm presenting my mind, I'm setting it upon those things that are above, not on the things of the earth. And then the good news, if you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ, who's your life, appears, you will appear also with him in glory. Such good news. And it's not just about the future. It's about the right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, nothing stirs my soul more than talking about you, Jesus, and what you've done and what you've accomplished for us. And yet, Lord, I confess that I, daily I can just go about it in, the, in my own strength, not really contemplating and considering the great truths, the great riches that are mine right now in Christ Jesus. Lord, forgive me. And, and Holy Spirit, create in me a, a rhythm, a regular rhythm of considering the knowledge that you've entrusted to me through a, a daddy and a mama that love Jesus, through godly pastors in my life that love Jesus and friends and, and a wife. Lord, may I consider and contemplate the wonderful knowledge that you've imparted. And then, Lord... May your grace motivate me to lay down my life and to present myself unto you as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable in your sight. God, I don't pretend that I can earn your favor, that I can uh, hit 10 on the scale of, of holiness. I don't, I don't pretend that at all. Lord, I know that my best stuff is often messed up by me and my flesh. And so, uh, yet God, I take great confidence in your grace that motivates me to want to die into sin and live into righteousness to present myself unto you for righteousness as opposed to unrighteousness. So Holy Spirit, have that kind of way in me and in my, my friends here, uh, the men and women gathered for this service. I, I pray that you would do the same in them. And Lord, it's not for our glory. It's not for our namesake. It's for your glory, for your namesake. And we thank you. It's for our good. You're so kind in that. Lord, bless us as we go through the rest of our day, our work. Uh, our relationships, all that is before us, may we present ourselves as instruments for righteousness, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this production of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. For more information, please visit gpts.edu.